It's okay, I'll pay for a new one. <laughs> All right, we'll, 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 keep, we'll, we'll, we'll keep that there. I'm going I'm to I'm stand over here for today. <laughs> Everyone stand with me as we turn to hymn number 636. 636. Welcome to service, everybody. Stand with me as we turn to hymn number 636. No, not one. Relatively undamaged. <laughs> There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. None as could heal all our souls' diseases. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. No friend like him is so high and holy. No, not one. No, not one. And yet no friend is so meek and lowly. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. On the last verse. Was there a gift like the Savior given? No, not one. No, not one. Will he refuse us a home in heaven? No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. He's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Thank you, everybody. Let's bow our heads for a word. Lord, we thank you that, here, that we are here today gathered in your name. I pray that you may help us, that you may prepare our hearts for the, the service today, and that you may just continue to take care of us and as you bless us and provide for us, Lord. I pray that you may help us to always seek you, seek your will, seek ship with you. I thank you for all these things. I pray that you may help us to have a wonderful service today, complete with a, with a good message and good fellowship. I thank you, and in Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, as we're staying standing, let's turn our hymns over number 535. 535, he is able to deliver thee, that he is. 535, he is able to deliver thee. We don't have the right hymn number. Hold on. Forgive me for a second. I should have checked beforehand. Let's see. What's Look, the hymn number? Looking in the glossary or not. 335. Three, five. Someone beat me to it. Thank you. Uh huh. There we go. Now Close we enough. Only 200 three. hymns off. We're all right there. 335. He is able to deliver thee. Take two. Tis the grandest theme through the ages rung. Tis the grandest theme for a mortal tongue. Tis the grandest theme that the world e'er sung. Our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. Though 
my sin, oppressed, go to him for rest. Our God is able to deliver thee. Tis the grandest theme in the earth or made. Tis the grandest theme for a mortal strain. Tis the grandest theme, tell the world again. Our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. Though by sin oppressed, go to him for rest. Our God is able to deliver thee on the third. Tis the grandest theme, let the tidings roll to the guilty heart, to the sinful soul. To God in faith he will make thee whole, our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. By sin oppressed, go to him for rest. Our God is able to deliver thee. All right, thank you for bearing with us. You may have a seat. <coughs> As we turn <coughs> announcements over to Brother Rick Damascus. missionaries already, uh, spoken of one uh, in a country that is uh, forbidden for missionaries to be there. Uh, we talked about a missionary here in uh, Colombia, and uh, today we want to talk about the uh, missionary that we support here, uh, the RC family to Venezuela. So we'll go ahead and show their video at this time. I hope it is a blessing to you. Hello. Hello. We are the R.C. family, your missionaries in Venezuela since 2007, serving as church planters in the rural areas. These last five years, our ministry has been intentionally aimed at impacting communities with evangelism within the public school system, reaching teachers, parents, and students with basic knowledge of how to function as a family, but at the same time with a clear presentation of the gospel. Our goal has always been to train the nationals through personal discipleship and mentoring so they can evangelize their own country and obey God's calling to reach all nations also. God has allowed us to also reach out through the Feed the Children ministry, medical clinics, and through humanitarian aid prompting the body of Christ to present the gospel and simultaneously attending to the most basic of needs for food, medicine, and helping the most vulnerable. So from my family and from the people of Venezuela, we would like to say thank you for your prayer and for your support.
Uh, we read their prayer letters each uh, Sunday evening, um, well, uh, throughout the, uh, the other missionaries that we support. Uh, but Sunday evenings we get to hear from our missionaries and to be encouraged about what they're doing uh, in a country where we probably wouldn't step foot. Uh, but they have the opportunity to reach people with the gospel, and we have an opportunity to please by our prayers, by our support updates. I mean, uh, for um, their plans for 2022, so I encourage you to go on. You just look up the RC family, A-R-C-E. Uh, look them up and they'll, you'll see all their videos of their ministry and it'll be an encouragement to your heart knowing that you can play a part in that uh, through missions. Uh, once again, it is missions month. Uh, we are talking here about each one, reach one. Uh, although every emphasis, or every Sunday we have an emphasis on missions and we have an emphasis on the gospel wanting to reach the world, uh, reach local. Uh, we take an opportunity each year uh, to focus in on our global missions, uh, the outreach that we have, reaching countries where uh, we have never been before but we we know someone was called and uh, responded to the call by God to go to that country and reach them. Uh, so we have an opportunity to financially uh, assist them each year. We've uh, participated since we started the church with what we call faith promise giving. Uh, it's something in addition. I know we, as, uh, as, as Christians we give already through our tithes, but we give something in addition to those things, uh, more of a, uh, a free will offering uh, as we would find in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And uh, as we give to missions, we have uh, uh, an idea of what we can give to our missionaries by uh, pledges that are made from the, uh, the members here at the church. Uh, if you'd like to participate in that, grab a card from the back table. Uh, at the end of the month, we're actually going to take these cards. We're going to uh, uh, count up the, uh, the pledges from the individuals within the church to determine our missions giving for this upcoming year. Uh, each year we've seen an increase. Honestly, I really wasn't expecting much to come through the first time, but uh, with 4,000 pounds was committed through the church to give on our first year. I was pumped. I was excited. And then, of course, the next year came around. I was like, all right, we'll just give the same amount. But then it went up to si over 6,000 pounds. And then the year after that, up of s over 7,000 pounds. So uh, it continues to increase uh, as the church continues to grow and as our faith continues to grow. Uh, and what we see are our capabilities or we trust God and we give our confidence in God and what uh, he has uh, fulfilled and what he requires of us to give and uh, we see uh, that increase and I once again want to see that again this year uh, for Open Door Baptist Church. It's a blessing to be a part of missions. It's a blessing uh, to be reached uh, uh, to reach others with the gospel locally, but so much more as we're able to extend our arms to uh, the world. If you have your bulletin, we'll just uh, a few other announcements here uh, that we'd like to go over uh, before the choir comes and sings for us. Uh, but we have here changed, uh, but we have our service here at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and we also have a 6 o'clock service this evening. Uh, we have a church planner. He's from the U.S. Uh, he started a church in Perth, uh, Perth, uh, not too far from here. Uh, using testimony, he and his wife, and uh, it would be an encouragement for our church to be here to hear the testimony, uh, hear the preaching from God's word, uh, and to have our hearts encouraged once more for uh, local and global missions. Also keep in mind, uh, we have the, the Youth Connect after the services, uh, as well as uh, we have services throughout the week with the Ladies Book Study at 7 o'clock on Tuesday. Uh, if you'd like to come be a part of that, my wife, she gets uh, quite a few ladies uh, involved each Tuesday. Uh, they do it through either Zoom or through in person. Uh, so communicate with her if you'd like to be involved in that, as well as our Wednesday evening Bible study. We finished the book of James uh, here this week, and I've I, I loved the book of James. I think I could spend a lot more time in it than I usually spend in a book, um, but uh, it's been an encouragement to our hearts. Uh, we'll be, uh, I'm debating. I, I have these uh, other two books. I'm looking at the book of Hebrews as well as the book of 1 Peter. Uh, it's all part of my, my personal studies that I've already been doing, so I'm trying to decide which one I'd like to go ahead and talk about here on Wednesday evening. So come, uh, be a part of those uh, Wednesday evening evening studies that we have here uh, at the uh, uh, here in Kinkworth at seven o'clock each um, each Wednesday so many more events here happening uh, a lot of news uh, happening uh, here within Open Door Baptist Church uh, memorable things that happen throughout the week you can find in the back of the bulletin uh, just be encouraged church that things are happening 
And uh, they're happening, and it's, it's not because of our own ability. It's because we've trusted God, and we have confidence in God. And as we move forward, especially with this uh, facility, uh, the opportunities to be able to purchase it, Lord willing. Uh, we know that there's going to be other buildings up for sale, but we're just trusting God and his leading. This is a, a prime location for us uh, in the outreach that we've had already since starting Open Door Baptist Church. And uh, we look forward to it. We'll talk more about uh, more of our, our campaign and uh, purchasing of the facility on our anniversary Sunday, which is happening on 9th October. Uh, so invite friends to come be a part of that. So next week you'll have some flyers you'll be able to pass out to your friends uh, and, and, uh, and family. We'll have uh, what we usually do on our anniversary Sundays. It's, it's been a variety, but we love food. All right. I mean, if you're if you're <laughs> if you're a Christian and uh, you love fellowship, well, you'll love food and fellowship at the same time. So after the anniversary Sunday on that service, we won't have a Sunday evening service that day, but we'll kind of combine it all together and have one big service of fellowship with singing and with food and uh, just a time of uh, reflection. Uh, we'll have a video presentation. Follow us along. With it. So we're actually going to have the choir come and sing, and then we'll have our hymn right after that. So we'll have the choir come and sing, so they can move forward with the kids. Uh, Sunday school class. So at this time, come forward. Jesus is the way 
special each one reach one all right we'll go ahead and dismiss the children for their classes at this time and we'll all stand together we'll sing together 336 336 as we sing together amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me 336 let's all stand together For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh unto God, for no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. He that speaketh 
in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied, for greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret, that the church may receive edifying. Now, brethren, except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine, and even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? For if the trumpet give an unclear, uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself for the battle? So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For he shall speak into the air. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. Therefore, I know not the meaning of the voice. I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. As ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel in the edifying of the church. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. Else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou seest. For thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. Thank you, Brother Bill. All right, you guys may stay seated this time. Turn to hymn number 19. Hymn number 19. You all may stay seated this time. Turn to number 19. Love divine, love all loves excelling. Love, love divine. Oh. I know. All right, let's let's try that again. again. Let's start again, yeah. on 
great salvation, changed from glory into glory, till in heaven take our place, till we cast our crown before. Uh, Alright, I'm going to be up front with you guys. There seemed to be a bit of confusion. Uh, the way I remember this song is, is, a bit, is a bit different, so maybe that's just America versus the UK, so sorry about that. Uh, no, that's the way I remember it. Love divine, oh love excelling. Is that how everybody knows? All right, you just can't get bills these days. I don't know what's going on. Is right. <laughs> no, we appreciate Bill putting all the bulletin together here for us. Uh, it's uh, nonetheless, it was a good song. You know, we love the words to the songs. We love the encouragement that we get through it. So appreciate everybody singing and congregational singing. And we'll, we'll mix things up around here. You know, and this is how we work. It, we never, we're never consistent. But you know what? We have an ultimate goal in mind, and uh, we just fulfill that goal. You know, for the praise and honor and glory to God. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we're now to the the best part of the service here today. Uh, it's been a for us with his son for a wedding, and uh, we've had uh, Brother Don Clow come over here from Bockabers. Uh, so today we have a special. Uh, speaker, uh, Ben Tabor, coming to speak for us today. Uh, known him for not even a year yet, but uh, we've, uh, uh, at least I feel as if we've grown closer together, uh, coming into Bible studies, uh, we can always count on Ben uh, to have uh, an input, and it's always something good. It's always a, a view on a passage of scripture that many of us were like, oh, okay, well, hold on a second. <laughs> and it's been good, it's encouraging, and um, we, uh, we, it's iron sharpened with iron, and uh, it's good to have uh, people around you that can help you learn more from God's Word, and I hope that I could be the same encouragement to him. So looking forward to hearing uh, Brother Ben come and speak for us today. All right, Brother Ben, why don't you come? Right. Just bear with me while I still put on my uh, microphone. work okay okay can everyone hear me I can, I can even hear me that's great okay <laughs> I used to work in a um, RAC call center and um, we, we had a headset like this or well, a bit like this then and uh, you can probably hear my voice is starting to go a little bit and I remember when I worked when I first started working at that call center I was told that um, the life expectancy and by, by life expectancy that meant you know for, for somebody working there is about four years and the reason was it's because I've just been practicing my sermon so much, but uh, alas, I don't think that's the, uh, that's the only reason. But anyway, uh, if you could turn with me in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. Um, so I'm reading through Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verses 19 to 25. So Hebrews chapter 10, 19 to 25. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us, through the veil, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with the true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to, to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now, before I moved to Aberdeen, I've been in Aberdeen about 18 months, I used to live in the southwest of England, and I was part of a church that had a pastor who was, he was quite an impressive scholar, so this particular pastor, he was multilingual, uh, and he had this approach to studying the Bible, uh, whereby he used to read through the same book of the Bible over and over again until he really got a grasp of what he felt God was saying. Now, when it, when it came to the book of Hebrews, I remember him saying, if I rem remember this correctly, I think he said it took him about five years to really get to grips with what Hebrews was saying. And that seems quite extreme, but 
the more I return to the book of Hebrews, the more I can empathise with, um, with, with the fact that it did take him that long. Hebrews isn't an easy book to understand in many ways. Firstly, there are some things about Hebrews that we, we simply don't understand and can't understand. We don't know, for example, who the author of Hebrews was. We can speculate who it was. We think it might be Paul. We can't know for sure. I think I lean towards the view that it could be Apollos, um, but I can't prove that. We just don't know, and we have to accept that we don't know. Also, it's a complex book. The structure is quite complex. You know, it's written in a very eloquent, very sophisticated sophisticated form of Greek. It's still Koine Greek. If you know what Koine Greek is, it's the type of Greek that's used for the New Testament, but it's the type of Koine Greek that you won't find anywhere else in the Bible. So that presents a problem. It's also the longest argument or sustained argument in the New Testament. Well, not just the New Testament, the whole Bible. So you have to be able to follow that argument from start to finish to really grasp and understand what Hebrews is saying. So there's a, a few barriers that you need to overcome when reading and trying to understand the book of Hebrews. But there are some things we can know. So, for example, we can know that, for, for example, there are things that are clear about Hebrews that we can know. So we can know, for instance, that it was a letter to a church or a group of churches and as such it was intended to be read from start to finish as a sermon would be read we can know um, and we can infer from the content that the intended audience was predominantly Jewish and as we read Hebrews we can see that the writer makes a rhetorical argument and it's a rhetorical argument that's intended both to encourage but also to warn his target audience so when we get to chapter 10 of Hebrews, we arrive at a point where the writer has spent a lot of time describing the Christian life as a pilgrimage of sorts. And he uses several athletic metaphors on how believers are to keep making forward momentum, such as in Hebrews 2.1. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. He also goes into significant detail about how the temple cult of ancient Israel relates to the ongoing ministry of our risen Lord. Let us draw near, he says, with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with a heart sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. I don't know if any of you have ever heard the saying, the New Testament is in the old concealed and the Old Testament, it, it, or the Sorry, I'll say that again. The New Testament is in the Old contained, and the Old Testament is in the New explained. It's sometimes paraphrased as the New is in the Old concealed, and the Old is in the New revealed. And that quote comes from Augustine of Hippo. But Hebrews is a prime example of what this means. Here, the author is speaking directly to the Old Testament law, which would, have, which would of course, been very familiar to his Jewish target audience. And he does so to encourage them to seek a close relationship with God. Now, this isn't the first time the writer of he Hebrews urges this. Earlier in chapter 4, he says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. He's saying here that they, his Jewish audience, and by extension us, have permission to come boldly before, before God irrespective of our sins, to seek grace and mercy whenever we might need it. Simply put, this confidence is the free right of approach to God because of, God's, uh, because of Christ's sacrifice for us. Now, is this something as Christians that we've really grasped? Because it really is essential to living a victorious Christian life. I remember when I was about nine years old, I think, I always used to love going to my auntie's house, my auntie's and my cousin's house, because my cousin, and I'm giving my age away a little bit here, but my cousin had a Sega Master System. I don't know how many of you remember that old console, but um, when I was nine years old, that was one thing I definitely coveted at that time. And there was a particular game that he used to play called Wonder Boy in Monster Lands, and I, there's probably no one here that would know that game, that game title, maybe there's one or two, but um, just to explain it, it, it was kind of Sega's version of Legend of Zelda, if anyone knows that game. Um, which is probably a bit, a bit you know, more widely known. And 
I remember once getting to a level on, on Wonder Boy, Wonder Boy Monsterland, and I couldn't get past this level. And I, because I was getting frustrated as a nine year old, you know, it's, it's the end of the world when you can't do these things. And I, uh, I remember just throwing an almighty tantrum and this lasted for a good half hour or so. And then eventually I, I started to calm down. I think my, my auntie gave me a big hug and I, I kind of sheepishly went back to my cousin and said, you know, Josh, can you please show me how to complete this level? Uh, you know, because I'm stuck. And of course he knew I'd had the tantrum and I was quite taken aback as a nine-year-old because it was the first time I'd heard my cousin shout at me. And he basically said, how, how dare you ask me to, you know, to help you to do this? It's, you know, you, you can't do that after you've had a tantrum. And, you know, not without some just cause, you know, he, had, he, he made his point. But God isn't like that. He's not going to shout at us. You know, when, when we've messed up, when we've uh, sinned, no matter how bad the sin is, God is always, you know, willing and ready to forgive, forget, and to give grace and to heal. Now, he's saying here in verse 22 that believers have access to the most holy place, which is the heavenly sanctuary entered by Jesus on our behalf. This is a living way, not in the former, now obsolete way, where the congregation of Israel were kept separate whilst the Levitical priest made intercession for them, but in a real, living, supernatural way because Jesus is our high priest who lives forever and his work is of eternal significance. Jesus opened, or you could say inaugurated, this way with his own blood. We are invited to follow him into God's presence, trusting in his high priestly mediation. This is why the temple curtain was torn the moment Jesus gave up his spirit, the gospels tell us. This represented Jesus' body being pierced so his blood could be shed before he died on the cross and rose, rose again to open a new way of direct access to God's throne. Without going into too much graphic detail, if you understand scourging and the way scourging worked in the first century, the way the Romans did it, we can with confidence assume that Jesus' flesh would literally have been torn uh, when he was scourged. And that was important as part of the process of Jesus being able, through his death and subsequent res res resurrection, being able to open that way to God that was pre previously closed to us. You see, formerly it was a high priest who would have performed those duties, but we're told here that Jesus is our high priest. Have you ever noticed in the New Testament epistles, sometimes our Lord referred, is referred to as Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus. The epistle says Jesus Christ. This refers to him during his earthly ministry. But when they say Christ Jesus, this refers to his heavenly ministry. We need to understand that Jesus, is, Jesus Christ's ministry on earth may be finished, but Christ Jesus' ministry in heaven is still ongoing. And as the reigning son of God, he continues to intercede for us as our high priest, thus sustaining us on our journey, or pilgrimage if you like, to heaven. Hebrews 7.25 tells us, Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. There is a very real sense in which the right of approach to God we enjoy now, through Jesus, allows us to anticipate the ultimate experience of entering God's presence in the new Jerusalem the eternal city. Again, is this something that we as, we as believers appreciate? Is it something we even celebrate as we should as believers? So how are we to continually be drawing near to God? How do we do this? This involves confident prayer for mercy and grace to help us in times of need, keeping a short account of our sins, not letting sins mount up before we seek forgiveness, not being afraid to turn to God when we know we've messed up, no matter how bad the sin is, and to do so with boldness and with a sincere heart and the full assurance of faith that allows us to have that boldness. Not with, as Hebrews 3.12 says, a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. The Lord wants us to be fully invested in our eternal hope. We are to we are also to draw near to God in our private devotions. 
but God wants us also to do this collectively as a fellowship of believers. So what might this look like? Well, it certainly involves reflecting on Scripture together as, uh, so that we might, as Hebrews 3, 7 puts it, hear his voice. We do this when we meet together to worship on a Sunday, and some of us do it when we meet for the midweek Bible study, but it doesn't have to end there. It means giving unified prayers, praise and thanksgiving for the person and work of Christ with confessions of faith. Hebrews 3.15 says, let us, sacrifice, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. It includes believers partaking in the Lord's Supper or even sharing a fellowship meal together. It also means making acts of dedication and commitment, such as when we meet, for example, for a baptism service, as we did earlier this year. And when we met for, the, for those baptisms, I think it was twice this year at the River Dee, there was this real sense that as a collective group of, group of believers, we were drawing nearer, nearer to God together. You know, that's the case for the person being baptised, but it's also the case for those people who are coming to celebrate that, that saved soul and that public declaration of faith. And I think there was a witness in that too. You know, certainly we attracted a crowd who could see you know, that we were sincere about our faith. It may have been a curiosity to them, but you know, they took note of what was happening there. Now on to verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. What do we mean when we talk about a profession of faith? The Old Testament, in the Old Testament we have what's known as the Shema, which was and still is a profession of, of faith amongst the Jews, so called after the Hebrew word for hear or listen. For example, hear, hear Israel, Yahweh is our God, Yahweh is one, Deuteronomy 6.4. This is essentially a short statement of faith proclaiming Yahweh, the God of Israel, as the one true God. By the time we get to the New Testament, the early Christians had the kerygma. Now, the kerygma is the profession of faith of the, in the early church, a proclamation of Jesus Christ as Messiah and the Son of God, his death and resurrection. But the word faith, which we see here in the King James Version, is actually better translated as hope, which you will see in other translations. So, how does a profession of hope differ from a profession of faith? Perhaps the best example of a profession of hope we have in Scripture is in 2 Timothy 4, six, uh, sorry, 2 Timothy 4, verses 7 to 8. Right, I've finished the race, I've kept the faith, now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only me, but for his appearing. Now these are considered the final words of the Apostle Paul. He had reached the end of his life of service to the Lord, and could express with confidence the assurance of his hope, not only of salvation, but also of glorification and of eternal reward. How could he be so sure? Because he knew he had been faithful. And Paul's faithfulness was only made possible because of his close relationship with the Lord. Remember, this is the same man who said near the start of his ministry, O wretched man, who shall deliver me from the body of death? And there may be many people here today who can relate to this statement and might be mourning their spiritual condition. But if so, that he was able to speak with confidence at the end of his life. And we know that if we follow Paul's example of really cleaving to God, we can also have this confidence, or if you like, assurance of our salvation. Hebrews 4.14 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is poured into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. You see, Jesus is both the object of our faith and the one who gives us a firm and secure hope because of his death, resurrection and glorification. Hebrews 6, 9 says, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. Believers are to hold on to this hope, to hold fast or tightly grasp this hope, to treasure it and clasp it as something of priceless value. Verse 24, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Believers should remind each other of this hope each time we meet. 
And we should do this because, as verse 24 highlights, it provides a motivation to believers to do the good works. We should not just be doing it individually, but thoughtfully encouraging others to do as well. As Galatians 6.9 puts it, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we contemplate. So believers are to contemplate or give careful consideration to how we are to encourage each other, both to love and to good works. But how can we do this unless we are meeting together regularly? Getting to know each other, ministering to each other by quoting scripture and applying, applying scripture to each other's circumstances, discerning each other's spiritual gifts and pointing to how someone might use that gift in the service of God. I've been a Christian now for a little over 20 years and in that time I've, I've moved around quite a bit, as you ima would imagine would be the case over over 20 years. Um, I know some people stay in the place, same place, but I, I have had a bit of a nomadic uh, uh, life, you could say, just moving around to different places. I've lived in England, different parts of England, um, the West Midlands, south of England. I went to university in Wales, and now I live in Scotland. I know there'll be people here who've moved around a lot more than that, but as a consequence of that, I've been involved in different churches and fellowships. And in each fellowship, there's always been this inner circle of believers who you can, you know and can rely, that, that rely on them, that nine times out of ten, they will always be in the morning service, they will always be in the evening service, and they will always attend the midweek Bible study and will be, will be present at any prayer meetings that might be taking place. And I know that when I was, certainly when I was part of a Brethren church in the south of England, it was almost beaten into me that you attended the morning service, you attended the um, evening service, you attended the midweek Bible study, and you went out and you, you, you were involved in the evangelism they did, um, both at the weekend and in the week. Um, and, you know, saying beating, beating into me probably isn't too much of an exaggeration, but, um, you know, that's the Brethren church for you. But I think there is real value in that. And certainly as I've matured as a believer, um, I, I do see real value in making the effort to attend as many of the church services any given church might have. And since I've been part of this church, I can honestly say the people I've come to know the best are those who also make the effort to attend each of the meetings on a regular basis. And this is because, you know, when we've studied the Bible together midweek, or looked at systematic theology as we, we did a few Sundays ago and for a while, I've heard people's testimonies. I've gotten a sense of their church background and doctrinal stance. I've heard their prayer requests and shared that with them in Christian service at times. And this is what happens when Christians have regular fellowship. The advantages of this can't be overstated. For one, we know, and scripture teaches us, that there are, there are certain prayers which really need to be prayed by believers collectively. Prayers of intercession, for example. But there are also benefits when outside of fellowship. I know, for example, that those people I meet with here regularly, for, you know, for both services on a Sunday, the midweek Bible study, I know that they will have a good idea of how to pray for me. They will know exactly what I'm going through, how they need to be praying for me, and I for them also. So my spiritual life benefits as a consequence. The Christians who don't meet regu regularly are really missing out on this blessing. Now, at work, I work for the, as some of you know, work for the local job centre. We have to have a certain number of appointments every day, and most of those appointments will be face-to-face -face appointments. There are two appointments that we're allowed to have each day that we can make by phone. But during the pandemic, the majority of the appointments we, we made were by phone for obvious reasons. People couldn't come to the job centre whilst, um, you know, the pandemic was ongoing and before a vaccine had been found. Now, since things have returned more or less to normal, we, we, we're now back to two phone calls a day, but that was more than we actually allowed prior to the pandemic. And what I'm finding, as I have different people that I deal with on what's called a caseload of, of different claimants who are still claiming benefit, is that there are still a significant number of people who would much rather have a telephone appointments that meet me face to face and I try not to take that personally but I know that they, there are various reasons for that 
Some of those reasons are justified. Some people live in remote locations. Unfortunately, Aberdeen only has one job centre, or Aberdeenshire only has one job centre uh, to cover uh, areas such as Inverory, I think Stonehaven, uh, and also Aberdeen. Um, or one location, rather, where there are job centres. And that makes it difficult for people who might live further afield. But there are also people who just prefer a telephone appointment because they don't want to make the effort of coming to the job centre. They don't want to be confronted face to face if they're not doing everything they should be doing. And I find it hard on a personal and professional level to really engage with those people who are having telephone appointments as well as I do those who are meeting me face to face. And the reasons for that are, are pretty obvious. Those people, um, I can't always tell if they're telling me the truth. There are certain visual cues that I look out for. I think it's been said um, and it's, it's estimated that um, only or up to 80% of communication is non-verbal. So if I'm only speaking to somebody by, the pho by phone, then there are certain things I'm going to miss that I will pick up on when I see them face to face. And I think that applies to a certain extent with, with fellowship as well. You know, you can watch a live stream, um, as we all did during the pandemic, uh, but in, and you can even have fellowship after that live stream. I certainly had that in my former church, but it's just not the same as when you meet face to face. And as I was finishing preparing my sermon, almost by coincidence, I discovered that, I don't know how many of us will know that, but this, but since 2009, the third Sunday of every September has been known, uh, amongst evangelical churches at least, as Return to Church Sunday. There will be various churches putting on events and bringing in speakers today with the intention of encouraging people to return to church. I know that there may be some people watching the live stream today who have not returned to church since maybe before the lockdown. I understand there may be various reasons for this. Some of these reasons I know will be valid. But, you know, to those people watching today, if you're watching the live stream or if you're watching the recording later, I encourage you, heed the words of verse 25. The writer of Hebrews understood why some believers had been put off meeting together, together in fellowship. He knew many of those he was addressing had been persecuted because they'd identified as followers of Christ. He knew that because of this, they were now having second thoughts about leaving the relatively safe religion of Judaism to follow a crucified saviour who caused controversy in the ancient world. He also knew that the faith that they were now following was, was the true faith. He knew that there was none of the name of the be saved. And he also knew that the most effective way of enduring persecution was by meeting together in re regular fellowship and having solidarity with other believers in the midst of it. Okay, we as Christians in the UK may not be experiencing persecution to the extent of our brothers and sisters in places like Afghanistan or North Korea or parts of North Africa. But we know from the scriptures that persecution is coming. And even now we face a subtle persecution when it comes to free speech. We know, for example, that we risk losing our jobs if we stand up for the truth, which unfortunately actually happened to one of my peers from Bible college who was forced to leave his job after posting on social media how promotion of the LGBTQ movement in schools harms children. He then became part of a targeted intimidation campaign, which involved, amongst other things, an undertaker turning up to his front door and asking if he could take measurements for his coffin. And this, this kind of persecution, unfortunately, is happening to believers, and we, we do hear these stories. And sometimes it's quite, quite close to home. And when this kind of persecution comes, and it will come for all who are fighting the good fight sooner or later, we will need close fellowship of fellow believers more than ever. And it is my prayer that we heed the exhortation of the Holy Spirit, the ultimate author of scripture, as he calls us to a, a closer relationship with God and deeper fellowship with each other. Amen.
head bowed and eyes closed here just for a moment. I've heard some promising truth from God's word today. The effects of our Christian fellowship is of great importance in our life. And if we don't have it, how do we expect to grow? We can often say, I can study the Bible on my own, and I can learn so much more on my own. But in reality, most cases, you're probably going down a path that is against God's word because you've chosen to do it yourself. You have no one to talk to, no one to iron, sharpen, iron kind of situation, no one to um, uh, rebuke you when you're stating something that's going against God's word. This is why we come together. This is why we do come in fellowship. We come exhorting one another. I mean, that word exhort really does uh, imply part way of encouragement, but also rebuking when we do something wrong. <laughs> and uh, we need that. And you may say, oh, I only come to church to be encouraged. Well, you know, sometimes we need to come to church to get rebuked too. I mean, uh, we're all sinners. And we need to be reminded of our sin nature and how we're prone to wonder, as the songwriter says, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Why do we come to that place? Well, because we're sinners. What helps push us in the right direction? God's word. Godly believers in whom we can come and exhort and encourage and not forsake the assembly of ourselves together. Maybe there's someone here today that doesn't know Christ as their personal Savior and a lot regarding church has become kind of something that kind of goes over your head. It's like, I don't understand. It's just a club. But in reality, church is the bride of Christ. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ, he died for the church. He gave his life for it. It's of something of great importance. And to be part of the church is to be one that is born again, one that is saved. The Bible tells us that we're all sinners, that we all deserve hell. But Jesus Christ became the penalty for our sins, not for just ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. He did so dying for us being buried in a tomb and three days later rising again to give us life through his name. No other prophet being around the world has ever accomplished such a great thing. But Jesus Christ alone. And he is who we put our dependence on. He said, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible tells us to believe heart that Jesus Christ is who he says he is and that what he did is exactly what he did. And we could trust him as our Savior. Make him your personal Savior today, recognizing who he is. If you're a Christian here today, let's think about what Ben was saying about the importance of church, the importance of considering Christ and what he did and whom he died for. Why are we forsaking the thing that Jesus died for? It makes no sense, right? Kind of puts us in a category that's not much a Christian, is it? We're going to have a hymn to sing here today. And I encourage you to sing along if you want to take your hymn book and sing along with us. 316. 316. We'll be singing, Is Your All on the Altar? If you're in the spirit of prayer, I ask that you continue to pray and ask for God's leading in your life and the decisions that you need to make to draw yourself closer to Him. But let's all stand together if you're able to sing. 316, Is Your All on the Altar? Five one six, guys. It's 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 no. It's number five one six. I apologize. You have long, long for sweet peace and for faith to increase and have us leave fervently. You cannot have rest or be perfectly blessed until all on the altar is laid. Is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? Your heart does a spirit control. Who can 
tell of all love He will send from above And how happy our hearts will be made Of the fellowship sweet We shall share at His feet When our all on the altar is laid Is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid Your heart does the Spirit control You can only be blessed And have peace and sweet rest as you yield him your body and soul. Watch everybody. I uh, hope you guys have a great rest of your time. And remember, we do have an additional afternoon service at 6 p.m. So hope to see you guys.